Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Leslie, and I'm the director of the New York Foundlings Vincent J. Fontana Center for Child Protection. Um, before we begin, I want to let everyone know that this session is being recorded and will be posted on the AFSAC website, YouTube, Vimeo, other locations. So we encourage you to keep your cameras on, but if you do not want to be in the recording, please turn off your videos. Um, if you have any questions throughout, feel free to type them into the chat. I'd also want to make everyone aware of some events coming up that you can see here on your screen. Um, we have a series of lectures um, leading to a certificate in eliminating systematic racism and child welfare, um, medical certificate coming soon. Um, we have the ABSAC Foundling online course, which um, is eight modules designed by 25 multidisciplinary experts and it has self, 10 self-directed hours of content, including continuing education credits. Um, there is a discount for 10% off today using discount code webinar10. There are some members only roundtables, so if you want to consider becoming an ABSAC member, please do so. Um, there is the ABSAC 27th virtual colloquium, which is July 11th through July 15th this summer. Um, we have a webinar series coming up co-sponsored with the New York Foundling Spontana Center. Um, and we'll, the first one's coming up on February 25th, and we'll put a link to that in the chat throughout this webinar as well. And we also have an eight-week um, comprehensive online course for child welfare and child maltreatment professionals, and that will be coming out soon, so keep your eyes open for an email about that. And there's also a um, eight-week course about dismantling white privilege. So, And we have the Blue Ribbon ABSAC NEK coming up as well. So lots of exciting events. Um, but now I'd like to turn it over to um, Dr. Schneiderman, who is the Senior, Senior Vice President of the New York Foundlings Vincent J. Fontana Center and an ABSAC board member, and he's going to introduce our presenters for today. Thank you. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> Welcome to the uh, workshop, No Hit Zones, Low Cost, Low Effort Interventions to Reduce the Hitting of Children. Uh, I'm also a member at large advocacy for the American Psychological Association, Society for Child and Family Policy and Practice. Um, this workshop is being sponsored by the American Psychological Association Division 37 Society for Child and Family Policy and Practice, the American Professional Society on the Abuse of Children, and New York Foundlings Vincent J. Fontana Center for Child Protection. Today's workshop is consistent with APA's 2019 resolution that calls for parents to stop hitting their children and to use alternative disciplinary measures. Um, uh, there also, it's consistent with the American Academy of, of, uh, of Pediatrics and the American Professional Society on Abuse of Children's policy and position statements on uh, uh, corporal punishment. Uh, the goal of today, well, the no hit zones are a way to reduce physical punishment of children by changing organizational practice. The goal of today's workshop is to inform psychologists and other professionals about the science behind no hit zones and how to implement no hit zones in schools and organizations. Uh, we are very fortunate today to have uh, leading experts, national experts in the field of violence to children. And I'm honored to introduce both of them, uh, all of them. Uh, first, Stacy LeBlanc uh, is the co-founder of the up Institute, Up Institute, a think tank for, child, for upstream child abuse solutions. She is the current president of the American Professional Society on the Abuse of Children. She is also the chair of the National Initiative to End Corporal Punishment's No Hit Zone Committee and is one of the nation's leading child advocates. Uh, Liz Gershoff is the Amy Johnson McLaughlin Centennial Professor of Human Development and Family Sciences at the University of Texas at Austin and Director of the Population Research Center. She is current president of the American Psychological Association Division 37 Society for Child and Family Policy and Practice and is 
the nation's leading researcher in the area of physical punishment of children. Brittany Brow has worked in the school system for many years and has several years of experience in community services. She is currently a school social worker at St. Rita Catholic School in New Orleans. Uh, Liz, uh, it's up to you now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mal. Sorry, Liz, I don't mean to interrupt you. Um, before we begin, um, I want to, um, we have, I was going to share some polls with you guys to kind of see your affiliation oh, sure. with organizations and to see exactly what you know about No Hit Zones. But Liz, while I'm doing that, feel free to get your screen up and all of that. So I'm going to uh, launch some polls for you guys if you do not mind uh, filling them out. Go ahead. Thank you. Okay, so I guess we'll leave that up for a minute uh, before I start talking, since it's covering the screen. Or I guess you can kind of move it, can't you? I think you can begin to. I will okay. uh, move full soon so you have their full screen. <laughs> okay, great. Well, thank you all for being here. I have to say, I'm so delighted to see this many people interested in learning about no hit zones. There are several of us on this call that have been talking about no hit zones and the value they could have for our country um, for years, many, many years. And it was a small group of us for a very long time. And so it's wonderful to see hundreds of you interested in learning more about this initiative. So I'm happy to tell you um, what I know about it and then to turn it over to Stacy, who now is our resident expert on implementing no hit zones. I'm gonna focus more on the reasons why we might want a no hit zone and then the research that we have to date on no hit zones. So why do we need no hit zones? First of all, we need them because we know that physical punishment is harmful for children. We know that it does not lead to better behavior either in the short term or the long term. We know that it actually leads to an increase in aggression and antisocial behavior over time. So in fact, makes children's behavior worse. And we know that physical punishment like spanking is linked with several uh, unintended negative outcomes for children, including um, having mental health problems and having lower cognitive ability. So we just know from lots of research that I and others have done that physical punishment and spanking in particular do not achieve the goals parents want and are harmful for children. We also know that spanking is very much like an ACE, an adverse childhood experience. So the ACEs have gotten a lot of attention in the last few years, particularly from the public health community. And for those of you who know, ACEs, the original ACE scale has 10 different experiences children might have had in childhood. And the original ACE study, which was done with um, about 17,000 adults, um, asking them about their childhood experiences, they did ask about spanking, whether they had been spanked as a child. And so colleagues of mine and I did an analysis comparing having been spanked as a child with the other ACEs. And so what you see here are the 10 ACEs in black and then spanking in purple. And what you see is that um, the effects for spanking are very similar to the uh, effects that, uh, for things that we know are harmful for children. So sexual abuse, emotional abuse, physical abuse. These numbers are what we call odds ratios. And so the number to the right of the decimal point tells you the percent more um, that an individual being spanked um, experiences that outcome. So for example, someone who's been spanked has a 42% greater chance of having a drug use problem compared with someone who was not spanked. So what we see from this is Spanking is very much like what we already know is very harmful for children. And so perhaps we should be including that um, as an adverse childhood experience, um, just like we do for maltreatment. We also know that physical punishment can escalate into physical abuse. We know that um, I call our colleague Joan Durant in Canada did a survey of all child maltreatment cases one year and looked at physical abuse cases and for each of the incidents, parents were asked how the incident happened. And in 75% of those cases, parents mentioned that it was a disciplinary event. So the child had done something to anger the parent that the parent didn't like, and they punished them, and the punishment escalated into abuse. So there was a clear connection between these uh, physical punishment and abuse. Um, and so if we want to reduce abuse, 
a good place to start is by reducing physical punishment. We also know um, that as Mel mentioned, uh, five professional organizations across the United States have um, called for bans, not bans, but they've called for parents to stop using physical punishment and have encouraged their members to counsel parents not to use it. So the American Academy of Pediatrics, uh, the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, APSAC, American Psychological Association, and then uh, the National Association of Pediatric Nurse Practitioners, which is often known as NAPNAP. So each of these organizations has said, we think physical punishment, the research is very clear that it's bad for children and parents should find other ways of disciplining their children. And relatedly, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention <clears throat> back in 2016 released this technical package, which is um, advice for organizations that want to work on preventing child abuse and neglect. And in this technical package, they very explicitly say that if we want to reduce physical abuse, we are going to need to reduce physical punishment through educational and legislative methods. So basically this is the CDC saying, we might wanna have a ban on physical punishment um, as we've seen other countries do. 61 countries in total now have bans on physical punishment. That is probably not something that's gonna be possible in our country for a while. Um, and so rather than wait for that to happen, wait for the sea change to happen, we can do other more localized interventions uh, like no hit zones. And so finally, we know that physical punishment is prevalent. Despite all of the evidence we have that physical punishment is harmful for children, it continues to be used uh, by many parents across the country and around the world. So UNICEF did a survey of countries around the world and found that uh, nearly two thirds of two, two to four year olds uh, experience physical punishment from their parents. And in the United States, numbers vary based on the study, but a very comprehensive national survey uh, done by David Finkelhor at the University of New Hampshire, along with the CDC, found that half of children in a na that national survey were spanked in the previous year. So spanking and physical punishment are still very common in the US and around the world. It's also, uh, physical punishment is also prevalent in schools, which you may or may not know that physical punishment is still legal in some areas of the United States. Around the world, over 700 million children live in countries where school corporal punishment is permitted. So that a lot of children who are at risk of uh, being paddled or otherwise hit in schools. And this is a picture of a wooden paddle that is used in US schools. And so in the United States, uh, physical punishment in public schools is legal in 19 states and 100,000 children or more are paddled in public schools each year. And this map shows you the red states are the ones that still allow uh, physical punishment in schools. And we know that those are not the only two settings where physical punishment is happening. Parents are punishing children, not just at home, but when they're out in the community. Many of you have probably seen parents spanking or hitting or otherwise disciplining with physical means their children in a parking lot of a Target or in a store or at a library. And so we know that physical punishment is happening in many different places. This is data from a survey that I and my colleagues did of staff at two different medical centers. And we asked them if they had seen parents hitting children in the medical center. Um, so these are basically hospitals um, in the previous year and half of uh, physicians, a quarter of nurses and a little more than a quarter of other direct care staff, including social workers reported seeing parents hit their children in that medical setting. So we know that physical punishment is happening in many places. Uh, and a no hit zone can help us with that. Another reason that we need a no hit zone policy in many places is that when, par uh, when staff see parents hitting their children, they're not sure what to do. They're not sure if they have the right to intervene and if they even want to intervene, they're not sure what to do. So these um, results come from a survey that we did of staff before a no hit zone was put into place at a hospital. Um, and you can see we divided this staff into those who provide direct care for uh, parents and children and then other staff. 
And you can see that not wanting to embarrass the parent was a common response, concern that the parent might actually harm the, the um, staff person, worried that the parent might actually take it out on the child. So possibly even related to that embarrassment that they might anger the child, the parent more, and then they'll take it out on the child um, either in front of them or later. But you can see the most frequent response was, I was not sure what to say or how to stop the parent from hitting their child. So really it's just a lack of information about what to do in that situation. And so that's where a no hit zone comes in is it can give staff the tools and the information they need to intervene. So hopefully that um, survey has convinced you that we do need some kind of inter uh, community level intervention to prevent physical punishment of children. And thankfully, no hit zones are a way that we can do that. They are low cost and relatively low effort uh, interventions that do prevent physical punishment of children. So what exactly is a no hit zone? A no hit zone is an institutional policy that prohibits hitting of any kind, including parents spanking children. So most institutions already would frown upon adults hitting each other, um, including spouses hitting each other. Um, and so this just broadens that to include parents spanking children in the form of discipline, or at least what would, might be discipline in their minds. A no hit zone is what we think of as a bystander intervention. It is a way of informing and empowering people who are witnesses to violence to help them intervene. And many people have the instinct to intervene when they see someone being hurt. But when it's parents and children, many people feel uncomfortable because they're not sure if they have the right to intervene and what they might say. And so the no hit zone helps with that, helps give um, an institutional policy that allows staff people to kind of fall back on it uh, because then staff can say, well, this is not my personal belief. This is the institutional policy. Our organization does not allow hitting of any kind. So I'm sorry, you can't hit your child in our hospital. Um, and so that way, the staff person can kind of have the whole organization behind them rather, it be, rather than it being a one-on-one -on -one intervention, it now becomes the institution is now having this policy. And that basically makes staff feel more emboldened to intervene and more comfortable intervening. The very first no-hit zone was established at a children's hospital, Rainbow Children's Hospital in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, by Dr. Lolita McDavid. And we can kind of think of no hit zones almost the way we think about no smoking zones. So no smoking zones were started in hospitals as well. And they were a way of trying to protect the health of staff member, members, of patients, of visitors by preventing uh, any kind of smoking in the hospital. And a no smoking zone has an analogy and a no hit zone is very similar. We want to protect people. We want to keep people safe. Um, it can be very stressful to see or hear someone being hit or hurt. And so it actually helps the whole community by preventing violence against children. So the primary goal of a no hit zone is to create a safe and healthy environment for children, for families, for staff, and for visitors um, by preventing or ending, if they're already occurring, incidents of parent to child hitting. And then a secondary goal is to disrupt the parent's reliance on physical punishment and hopefully to encourage them to try non-physical forms of discipline instead. And the hope is that parents might go home and think differently about physical punishment once they know that their pediatricians, their teachers, uh, people they know in the community are not condoning this behavior. They might think twice about using it again and they might be more encouraged to try other methods of discipline. So it starts with the top down, and I think Stacey will be talking more about how no hit zones are actually um, kind of negotiated at an institution. But an institution basically has to decide to have a policy, um, and there's many ways that might happen. Sometimes it's in the hospitals that I've worked with, uh, one of them was a top down, the, the um, administration decided this was gonna happen and then it kind of got put into place. 
at a different hospital, it was very bottom up. It was um, the child abuse pediatricians and social workers who really wanted to see this change happen. And then they advocated for a no hit zone. Um, and then the administration decided to put it into place. So there's, there's different ways that a no hit zone policy can be decided upon. Once it is in place, the first step is to educate the staff um, to make sure they understand why the no hit zone is being put into place. And so from making them familiar with the research on spanking um, that I just very briefly described to you, explaining what the policy is um, and in the, uh, making it very clear that no violence of any kind, including spanking and other kinds of what we might think of as discipline are, um, none of them are allowed. And then making sure staff know that there are ways that they can intervene if they see a parent spanking or hitting a child. And so some, in some of the trainings I've seen, um, they might do scenarios to try to help staff think through what they might do if they saw a parent hitting a child. They might try to distract the parent um, and say, oh, can I, you know, can I come and give you a break? It looks like you're very stressed. Um, do you need to go um, attend to something else and I can watch your child for you? Can I give your child a toy or a coloring book or a snack? Um, you know, empathizing with the parent, saying, you know, parenting is so hard. Um, you know, I know it must be difficult in this situation. Is there a way I can help you? So trying to disrupt the parent's um, state of mind and behavior and trying to just prevent violence from occurring. And so staff are given these ways to intervene and empowered. Uh, the institution is basically saying it is now your responsibility to intervene if you see this happening. We don't want this to happen in our hospital. If you see it happening, please reach out to these families and try to stop and, uh, the violence from happening to keep children safe. And then hopefully provide some kind of education, uh, maybe a pamphlet or something like that, to the parents so that they can learn more about other ways to discipline their child. And so once the staff are trained, um, most institutions will put up signs around the um, organization. Um, they might put up posters, stickers, uh, they might have pamphlets to give to parents to explain the no head zone and explain why physical punishment is not a good idea. But in some way, they communicate the fact that their organization is a no hit zone. Um, just like, you know, for um, many of us for years, we've been seeing these no smoking signs, you know, around different um, places. Now you would see a no hit zone a sticker or sign instead. So I want to talk to you about an evaluation that um, I and some colleagues, including um, at least one colleague on this call, I know Kathy Taylor's on this call. So we collaborated on this evaluation of a no-hit zone at the Gunderson Medical Center in La Crosse, Wisconsin. And so they decided to implement a no-hit zone in spring of 2014, and they contacted us to see if we could help them evaluate their no-hit zone. So the great thing was they contacted us ahead of time so that we could do a pre-test and a post-test so we could see if there was change in attitudes over time. And so if you're thinking about doing a no-hit zone, I highly recommend that you do a survey of staff, of your of parents, of visitors um, beforehand, and then do a survey again after so you can look at change um, in your organization. And so at Gunderson, the staff were trained mostly through an online training. So there was basically a PowerPoint presentation that they watched. Um, some staff did receive an in-person training. That was an option as well. Um, they were given reminders kind of on their, you know, when they logged onto their computer, they were given little reminders to do the training. Um, and so most of the staff did complete the training. So that was thousands of staff members. They did put up no hit zone posters around the hospital. They did have some pushback from the, um, I forget what they call it at the hospital, but it's something about, you know, kind of whoever's the beautification committee of the hospital, they will only let posters be in certain locations. So they could only put them, I think, in elevators. They could put them in the pediatric clinic and maybe a few other places, but they couldn't just put them willy nilly in the halls. Um, and so depending on what your organization is, you have to think about what are the best places to put those um, for visibility um, for parents. They also did have some brochures that we helped them prepare um, that explain what the no hit zone is, explained other ways that they could discipline their child without hitting. And those were made available throughout the hospital. Here's an example of one of their posters um, and they paid for the, 
the photo. I just had the iStock version. This is the version that wasn't actually printed, but um, they did pay for the iStock photos, I promise. Um, so they wanted to communicate that um, hands are not for hitting. So you can see each of these photos, hands are um, some kind of loving uh, or friendly gesture between individuals. And they wanted to make that kind of clear. And so you can see, they say, tell others what you want to see rather than hitting them. Hitting or spanking has long-term negative effects and sends a message to others that violence is okay. And so they have their little no hit zone logo and they say Gunderson Health System has a no hit zone policy to help maintain a safe and healing environment for patients, families, and staff. So they explain what the no hit zone is, they kind of give a little um, educational message and then they have these all over the hospital. So in our evaluation study, we had 2,300 staff complete pre-test surveys, and then we had a more difficult time getting people to do the post-test survey. So we only had 623 staff. Uh, I will also say that the hospital in this case required that we do anonymous surveys at both points. And so we couldn't follow up the same people. Um, so we're not looking at within individual change, which would be preferred. So if you're gonna do a survey, I highly recommend that you do it that way. Um, so we just compared these two groups pre and post. And you can see about half of them were direct care providers like nurses, social workers, therapists, child life specialists, and physicians. We also surveyed 225 parents pre-test and 180 at post-test, and we recruited them through the pediatric clinic at the hospital. Um, and the majority of both groups were white and female, um, and so I it says reflecting the demographics of the area, but well, clearly the whole population is not female <laughs> in La Crosse, Wisconsin. So that really should just refer to the race, ethnicity, not uh, the gender <laughs> of the people. So what did we find? Well, we found that after the no hit zone was in place, and so we did this survey, I think about seven months after the no hit zone had been um, implemented, we found that staff were more likely to agree that spanking is harmful to children. So they learned that from the training. They are more likely to agree that staff have an obligation to intervene. Um, so that means that they're kind of understanding their role. They are more likely to believe it's appropriate for staff to intervene when parents are disciplining uh, with spanking, slapping, or hitting a child with a belt. And uh, encouragingly, they said they're more likely to have comfortable strategies to intervene when they observe a parent hitting a child in the hospital. And so that was good news, because that means now they have tools that they can use uh, when they see um, a parent hitting a child. And in fact, we found that when they saw uh, a parent hitting a child, once the no hit zone was in place, they are more likely to intervene than they were before. So before a little more than half intervened. And after the no hit zone was in place, it was more like two thirds. So that's exciting. That's good news that they're more likely to intervene. They were empowered. They had the tools to do it. As far as the parents, um, we only looked at the parent. We asked parents if they had seen any of the no hit zone materials because we realized it wasn't going to be very interesting to ask them about no hit zones if they didn't know what they were. And so we, 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 of the parent, the 200 and some parents, we asked how many of them had seen the posters or the pamphlets. And among them, we asked, um, uh, we kind of compared the ones who, um, who, well, we looked at all parents in that case. And then we looked specifically at those who said they spanked their children. And so what you can see here are the parents who are agreeing that um, first the no hit zone changed their thoughts about discipline. And so you can see that a quarter, uh, or I'm sorry, about a, a fifth of parents um, in total, and then 36% of parents who spank. Uh, I now think there are better ways to discipline a child than spanking 29% of all parents, but half of parents who spank. And I now think it is okay for medical professionals and staff to intervene if they see someone spanking their child. Again, about a quarter of all parents, but nearly half of parents who spank. So that last column is especially encouraging. It shows that the parents we want to reach, the ones who are spanking their children, are being affected by the no hit zone. So that's really encouraging news um, for an intervention perspective. We also asked them just to kind of explain um, any of their thoughts about the no hit zone. And these are just a couple of quotes from some of the staff. I think these were both nurses. 
Uh, the first, it gives me the tools I need to diffuse a situation and hopefully change future behaviors. So this person clearly understands both the short-term and the long-term benefit of the no-hit-zone intervention. And the second quote, though it is more difficult to intervene than ignore, the no-hit zone has made it easier to intervene by letting the parent know that this is an organizational policy that I'm carrying out rather than my own values being placed on them as parents. And so again, this just illustrates that idea that they have that they know they have the institutional support behind them. It's not just a judgment they're making in, the, in that moment. Um, so it makes it easier for them to intervene. Now, one no-hit zone um, can inspire others in the community. And so this happened with the Gunderson no-hit zone. Around the time that they implemented their no-hit zone, other organizations in La Crosse also began implementing no-hit zones following the lead of Gunderson. So their county health department, the public library, um, the women and children's shelter called New Horizons, the Parenting Place, which is a parent education agency, and a nonprofit community agency called Family and Children's Center each implemented no hit zones as well. So the nice thing about no hit zones is because they're fairly straightforward to implement, and Stacy's going to be talking about that, it's easy for them to kind of spread. Once one organization sees that it's pretty straightforward to do, other ones realize, oh, we can do that. Um, and so if your organization is the first in the community to do that, um, be prepared for questions from other organizations because they're going to want to uh, implement it too and follow your lead. So that's pretty exciting. And this is a great article um, about that uh, very, um, the fact that these are um, implemented in other uh, locations. So I have here some quotes from, um, this is from the La Crosse Public Library. Um, so this is the Youth Services Librarian. Um, and so she said that, you know, the checkout desk is a place where they often saw parents stressed and kids melting down. And so they put no hit zones for sure at the checkout. And she says, the library is a fun place and people don't like to leave. When you see the adult in the situation is occupied or dealing with another kid, you give a distraction kit to the kid who's upset. Security had noticed a dramatic decrease in situations at the checkout. So that's exciting. So they must have something called a distraction kit. I'd be nice, nice to know what that is exactly. Uh, if it's a little toy or if it's a, a book or what, what they're giving the child to kind of um, allow them to play with something. In the same article, um, someone from uh, the Parenting Place Community Center also was interviewed. Um, and uh, you can see this quote from her. She saw a child hitting a sibling and she said, sorry, you can't do that here. Um, and she said, we could just point to the sign. I could say, this is, this is our policy. It makes it very straightforward. There's no arguing. It's just, this is the policy. Um, and they also made sure to, um, if you see kind of the, the second to last paragraph, uh, the library realized that um, bathrooms and other secluded corners of the library is where some physical punishment was happening when parents felt like they were out a view of other people. And so they made sure to put signs in those areas. Um, and so the librarian says at the end, it's our space, we are setting the rules. It can be difficult, but now you have the language and the tools. Before I didn't know if it's my place to step in. Now I know it's very much my place. So you can see that with these tools, with this information, with the backing of the entire library, um, the staff there realize that they can and should intervene when they see hitting occur. So the last study I'll talk about is an uh, evaluation of a no-hit zone in Virginia, in Norfolk, Virginia. This is at the Children's Hospital of King's Daughters. Um, and they did a study of their no-hit zone in a uh, their general pediatric clinic. Um, I think this is still the case, at least back then, they only had the um, no-hit zone in the general pediatric clinic and not the entire hospital. Um, and I will say that there's a few folks on this call um, Melinda and Lou, who both were instrumental in getting uh, this no hit zone in place. So thank you to them for their work in making this happen. And so the staff at the hospital surveyed 244 parents. This was after the no hit zone had been in place for a while. Uh, the majority of the parents in this study were African-American, um, as you can see. And what they found was that when the pediatricians explicitly talked to the parents about the no-hit zone and gave them information about it, 
those parents were more likely to say uh, that their uh, views about discipline had changed. So it really, if the pediatricians addressed it and talked about it, it did impact the parents. However, elsewhere in the study, they say that only 29% um, had heard about the no-hit zone from their pediatricians, even though it had been in place for a year and a half. So what that suggests is that if you have an institutional policy, you have to remind staff about it, remind staff of the importance of talking to parents about it. Uh, particularly in medical settings, we know that um, doctors in particular and pediatricians are valued uh, for their expertise on parenting and parents trust them for that. Um, and Kathy Taylor, who is on this call, is the expert on that and has done that research. So thank you, Kathy, for helping us know about that. So no hit zones can be established anywhere. And I think Stacy will be talking about this. Uh, one of the more innovative uh, places that um, we saw no hit zones implemented was a district attorney's office. This is in Dane County, uh, Wisconsin, which is the home of Madison, Wisconsin. Um, and uh, Mr. Ozain is the uh, district attorney there. And he decided that his office handles child abuse cases and, and assault cases. And they said, you know what? We wanna have a very strong message that hitting is not allowed in our building. And so they created no hit zone there. Um, so that was pretty exciting to have a government agency have a no hit zone. Even more interesting also in Wisconsin, we've seen an entire city um, create a no hit zone. So Stoughton, Wisconsin is the first city to become a no hit zone so that all of their public facilities are no hit zones. And this is a uh, example of the little sign that they put up in all of their public buildings. So uh, this would be in parks, in libraries, in uh, schools, uh, in all of their kind of city buildings. They have no hit zones up to make clear that their um, city uh, frowns upon any kind of hitting, including parents hitting children. And then after Stoughton did that, then Madison Heights, Michigan also became a no hit zone. Um, their city council voted to do that. And so they also did a very similar thing, putting signs around their community. As far as I know, and Stacy may know more, but I, I think those are the only two cities that I know of yet that have done it as a kind of entire city policy, but um, Stacy may have more information on that that she can share. So I just wanted to end with a little bit of advice on implementing no hit zones, and Stacy's gonna be giving you more about this. But what I learned from working with these hospitals is that education is really key for getting staff buy-in, for helping them understand why this is a necessary policy and how it will actually make their jobs easier. Uh, because staff see violence anyway, but they don't know what to do and they don't know how to respond. And so the no hit zone actually helps them by giving them tools and giving them an institutional policy that helps them have a good response. It's also key um, to make sure that, um, that posters and pamphlets are available to parents so that they can see them anywhere in the hospital and, and that there's a way for them to learn more about nonviolent discipline if they're interested in doing that. And then if you haven't, again, if you haven't implemented a no hit zone and you're thinking about doing it in your organization, I highly, highly encourage you to do pre and post surveys. Um, Kathy and I have a, the survey that we created. We're happy to share it with you. Um, no cost. You can use it anytime. Um, and um, just to kind of that kind of pre post change can be really crucial for getting support from the administrators in your organization, from policymakers in your community, and even from funders, because sometimes you might want funding for child abuse prevention efforts. And if you can show the evidence that an effort like this is leading to change, uh, then you're more likely to get some, some grant funding perhaps. And we're all looking for that. Here's my uh, email. So feel free to email me with any questions you might have, and we'll have some time for questions at the end. Um, but that is what I have for you. And I also will say that I have all of my references here at the end. And so please feel free to email me and I can send you this PowerPoint slides and, um, and I can, uh, then you can have the whole slides and all the references. And that's it for me. Great. Um, Stacey, if, if I see, I think you're around. If you want to load up your PowerPoint, um, feel free to. 
And do you want to do some questions right now? Um, yeah, I can, while we're waiting, I have a question for uh, Dr. Gershoff. Um, have there been any evaluations of the two cities that implemented no hit zones uh, that have shown you a decline in rate of physical abuse, increase, et cetera? That is a wonderful question. Not that I know of. I seem to remember that I sent the questionnaire to the councilman who created the no hit zone in Madison Heights, Michigan, but I don't know if they ever did anything with it. Um, you could contact them and find out, but um, as far as I know, there haven't been any evaluations of those. Thank you. Um, another question that came through too was, um, um, did the implement implementation of the no hit zones influence staff attitudes about reporting suspected child abuse? That is a good question. I don't think we asked about that. Um, it, I'm trying to think if we asked any questions that would be like that and Kathy can jump in if she remembers, but I don't think we did, but that would be a good thing to find out in the future. Um, because I, yeah, that's a good, that's a great question. I actually don't know. Yeah, Kathy's saying I don't think so. So I, I don't think that we did. Hey, that's a good idea for the future though. So thank you. Exactly. And a lot of people are asking for your email again. I will put that in the chat as soon as uh, we get started with the next section. So thank you. I so can much. do that too. Oh yeah, perfect. Thank you. And any other questions we'll make sure to get to at the, at the end. Fabulous. All right. I'm trying to make sure I've got the right scheme. So I'm hoping that you guys are seeing this slide and we are rocking and rolling. All right. Well, thank you so much. It is such a honor and privilege to follow Dr. Gershoff. Her research, um, have been, I've said that she's a goddess in the field and we have Kathy Taylor who also, Dr. Taylor, who's done so much research and I've studied their research. And for years, I tried to say, what could I do to help implement it? And I did not invent no hit zones. I give total credit to Rainbow Babies and everybody who came before me. Um, but what I realized when I started to start mine, we were calling people over and over and over. And we thought, well, those of us who are really struggling, let's put it all down. So we wrote, there's a guide that you can get that's free. You don't even have to be a member, member of APSAC. I hope you are a member of APSAC. But this advisor, the board voted this addition to be free so that you can have access. And it's basically gonna describe everything I'm talking about and in a way that you can bring to someone else, an administrator in your organization to get their buy-in to help you where some of us may have struggled in the past and basically alleviate a lot of the misconceptions about cost and about difficulties and barriers and anxiety that some folks have about doing this. I want to start just by telling you a little bit about why I got into this. So just by way of background, um, I started out, um, graduated from law school um, and, and got my master's in 1989, um, was a prosecutor for the first 10 years of my career, kind of recognized at some point we were never going to prosecute our way out of this um, epidemic called child abuse. And so I went to Children's Hospital in New Orleans, started the Audrey Hepburn Care Center, where we went to evaluate over 1,800 kids a year. I assumed the operation of the New Orleans Children's Advocacy Center after Katrina and did that work for 19 years, 10 years as a prosecutor, just doing child abuse, starting a family violence unit, and then went on to do this medical work. Um, and I left there after, thir after 30 years, recognizing that I really want to be a part of the upstream solution. So with the um, partnership with Dr. Viola Von Eden, we have started the UP Institute to create upstream solutions. But just want you to understand what, what it was that inspired me to say, like, as a, a children's app, advocacy center operator and someone doing a medical program that I wanted to focus a lot of our attention on physical abuse. And so the, basically my story is pretty simple. For, for years, I didn't really think that was a part. My um, initial children's advocacy center didn't even do interviews for physical abuse. Then we finally opened our doors and we realized that we had to, we were the ones that had that knowledge. And we started recognizing that most of it was just like Dr. Gershoff and Dr. Durant found is that it started as physical discipline. 
And so at some point I tracked in, in doing this work, um, we had created a little book, check out the checkup, we're doing all these medical exam. And I started tracking and realizing that our sex abuse cases, the referrals were high. We were seeing about 1800 kids a year, but they were leveling off. Our physical abuse was really skyrocketing. So sometime back in about 2016, I decided to heat map. So we took a heat map, but this doesn't identify confidential information. And we recognized that the city of New Orleans, because our medical program served the entire Southeast of Louisiana and the Gulf Coast of Mississippi. And we recognized that New Orleans really was a hot spot. So we went one step further and we started looking at where was the abuse occurring. And so these red hot spots are the hot spots where it was happening. And when I had presented this at some point in time during a proclamation to the city council, so someone on the uh, NOLA for Life, which was studying the epidemic of murders that were going on and the high skyrocketing rates of murders in our city said, oh, I know that map. That's the murder map. And I'm like, no, no, no. This is the map of physical abuse uh, that's occurring in the last year. And someone actually gave me, they showed me, you can see the parallels. It really did look the same. And all of a sudden, it was just sort of like a light went off, like, the violence that we're seeing on the streets of New Orleans is starting in homes. And if we don't start doing something upstream to prevent this, to protect children so they can grow up without violence, we're gonna continue to see this. And so I wanted to be a part of the solution and so I had looked to what could we do? Now, at that time, I started a program called Dear Parents. Many of you I see smiling faces. I have pictures of you because I've been around at conferences, taking your picture and making them into signs. But when I first started out with Dear Parents, we actually wrote the messages from research on children's bodies from a campaign that started as Dear World after Katrina. But what we recognize in doing just a little bit of evaluation is that we were getting very negative feedback from parents. Parents were saying, oh, hitting hurts? I'll show you how to hurt. Don't you tell me what to do. There was definitely a piece that people did not like hearing from children how they should parent. And so we immediately abandoned this and said, what could we do differently? And so we started doing messages with professionals to translate the research into practice. But about that time, I came involved with Mel Schneiderman and his great work when he joined APSAC, he formed a summit and this group of people, many of whom are on this call, including Dr. Gershoff and Dr. Taylor, and there's Mel Schneiderman. Um, I think I saw Trish out there, but many of us, we went together and we spent two days studying what could we do. And there's actually an article that's written about all the work that's continuing to happen with this group. And I wanna highlight some of that work. Um, but I became in charge of chairing the National No Hit Sound Committee. Now I was very lucky because there were so many people that had been doing this work for a very long time and I have to give them total credit. Um, but Le uh, Deb Sendak, many of you may know, if you've ever been reached out, you probably got Deb's name. And Deb had done such amazing work in lots of different states, not just Ohio, where she was, um, in, in introducing no hit zones and helping people to develop them. Um, in addition, Dr. Alexander did a lot of work early on. He was in Florida and I was in Louisiana and people were saying, you're never going to get no hit zones in Southern states. And sometimes we say we almost competed with each other to see who could get it up. And it took us a little while, but we can tell you, we can help you learn from our mistakes. And we can also tell you how to make it easier um, and how it can be a low cost option for anybody. Um, but we formed together this group and I wanna give big, big shout out to, to Dr. Kelly, another um, pediatrician who's done amazing work on her own. Now, all of these folks are not paid to be a part of this committee. We just really felt the need to be able to share what we had learned, our lessons learned and how we could help others. So we developed a toolkit. Initially, it was just like a Google shared box that we would give to people because they would call us and say, can you give us your sample signs? Can you give us your sample distraction materials? Can you give us your presentation? And so we created a website um, that we donate money and keep it going. We don't make any money off of this. Um, but basically, we just try to get as many resources. And what I'm hoping that each and every one of you by the end of today will at least be interested to click on the website and maybe sign up 
to become a no hit zone or even just to become a no hit zone advocate because maybe you don't have an organization to sign up. Um, but we, and then if you have materials, if you have questions, put them there. Our group meets, we meet again tomorrow morning. We've been meeting, we met two weeks ago and we're always trying to figure out ways. We had a parent reach out to us who wants to get her pediatric office because she witnessed some hitting there and it really disturbed her. And she wants to get her pediatric office to become a new hit zone. So a lot of times we have folks that come from all different ways that they find us. And we've just developed this toolkit to help make it easier so folks don't have to go through the same aspects that we did. I do want to give a big shout out to Melinda. I see her on there and she has done amazing work and has actually used her organization with Champions of Children to bring in some exciting no hit zones and done some great work um, with Lou Lombardo. And, um, and Kelly was the first pediatrician to even write about no hit zones. So together this has been a, a almost like a uh, a shared passion that we have, but we need help from everyone to, to bring this to others. So we did write up how to do it. So you can bring this to others to help you understand. And everything I'm about to say today is in here. You can read about everything I'm talking about right here um, in a way that you can bring it to folks. But I do wanna encourage you to check out our No Hit Zone Toolkit really can walk you through it. Most of the time when folks call me, so if you register, you're gonna get an email um, from the Foundling office that will CC me, will give you my cell phone number. And if you have a distinct question, I schedule a time and I meet with you. And if I can't help you, I get one of my other team members on the committee to be able to help you with this. We also recognize that a lot of folks didn't have an organization or they weren't ready to hang up signs or they didn't get their administrative support yet and they weren't sure they didn't have a policy written and they just wanted to become an advocate. So we now have where you can become an advocate and you can take this sign up and actually on the um, whenever I update it, which takes a little bit of time, I have some interns that help me with this, but we'll add your name and add your organization, of course, with your consent to the website. And you can see all the folks who have signed up. And I find that can be a big piece, being able to say, look how many other children's hospitals, look how many other parks, look at all these other folks who have done this before us, look at all these other schools. That really helps you to be able to make the argument to get someone else to, to go in to help with this. Now, to understand, I think it's, I always want to give credit to Dr. Lita McDavid. At Rainbow Babies, she is a child abuse pediatrician. Back in the day, I'll never forget, I ran into her at the Chadwick Conference, and she told me she was doing this. And I'm like, oh gosh, I don't think I'd ever get anybody in Louisiana to go along with this. I can't get them to stop hitting school children with boards. And I keep, you know, doing legislative this. And she goes, well, just keep trying. And she hung up a sign that looked like a no smoking sign based on the same policies that were done in the 60s that really shown to reduce the, the reduction of smoking and that these smoke-free policies, and folks will tell me all the time, I hear this every time I present on this, yeah, but that's different, you know, um, spanking is legal. Well, I wanna pause for a second. Spanking is hitting of children Hitting of human beings, big, small, and animals is actually a battery and an assault in every state. However, it is true that there is what is called a defense, just like if you kill someone in defense of your, you know, self-defense, there is a defense of reasonable discipline. So before we just go out there and say, oh, it's legal, we need to make sure we understand that it's actually reasonable discipline is a defense to hitting a child. So we need to make sure we're clear about that. But the other thing I want to point out, smoking is legal. It is legal to smoke. It is still legal to smoke. And when these bans happened in hospitals, it wasn't that the federal government said you couldn't. It wasn't for many years. Um, you know, when I was a kid and I went on an airplane, people smoked on airplanes. I went to hospitals. Deb talks about going in the ICU with people on oxygen and they were smoking. It wasn't for years that smoking actually had legal bans, but outside smoking is still very legal as are many other activities that we continue to ban. So that's one of the things I hear most often. How can you say this? 
But I do want to make a, a point of, and I think I might have heard Dr. Gershoff reference it. We tend with no hit zones, we want to make it bigger than just that no adult shall hit a child. We really do believe it's important to bring it into an entire culture of safety around that no adult shall hit another adult in this environment, no child shall hit another child, no child shall hit an adult, and no adult shall hit a child. Some folks have gone one step further and put in their no hitting with words, which I love because I'm, I feel like psychological maltreatment is something we need to start addressing. And the other things a lot of folks have found success with is including no hitting of animals. But we do believe that the mantra is an important part of any signage and any campaign um, because it really helps understand that this is about protecting everyone. It's not about harming parents or getting in parenting business. It's about creating environments where this is safe. So we've had for a long time and really honestly, you know, right now we, we're, we're recognizing that we have signage that says you can't enter without a mask on, but there've been signs that says you can't enter without a shirt or shoes. And for smoking, it really has improved health over time. So the other thing that really helps in developing a new hit zone is the research. So Dr. Gershoff and Dr. Taylor, this research that they have conducted that showed that this has the most promise for changing attitudes really does help. And so on our no hit zone um, toolkit, if you go to the research um, drop down, you'll have all the articles. There are two that are in uh, publication right now. So please come back within the next couple of months. I know there'll be two more that'll be uploaded there. Um, one of which um, Lou Lombardo has written an entire chapter on it. Um, we also have a commentary and another, so a bunch of pieces that are coming out and coming your way to make it easier. So to understand that this started when I first looked at Opening Mind, uh, Deb Sendek gave me the name of like about 16 folks that had started No Hit Sounds. I reached out to all of them, heard all of their issues. And then first wave was definitely in pediatric clinics, in children's hospitals. And as far as I could tell, we were the 16th children's hospital in New Orleans to adopt the policy. And we made sure it was in every clinic, in every space with big, huge stop signs that were outside. Most recently, less than two weeks ago, we actually got the LSU School of Nursing to become a no hit zone. And what I love about it, their parking garage is connected with the medical school and the dental school and lots of other allied health um, organizations and educators and all their signage is going up in their parking garage. So it, it's bringing that message to so many different people, so many different folks. Um, and uh, as Liz already pointed out, Madison has become their followed suit. I don't know of any other, you asked the question. I don't know of any others. I know that um, Dr. Alexander has tried to do the same in Jacksonville um, and it keeps, keeps going back to city council to keep it going. But I do want you to see just how active this has been and how much more interest. So um, when we were starting, there was very few, there was like a dozen to call and we were exhausting the folks. This is how many views that we've had on this website since we started. And it's not a sophisticated website. No one was paid to do it. It was done on the ba our backs and on the backs of interns that helped us with increasing capacity. Um, we have had a bunch of visitors. Every time we do a presentation, every time you share something on um, social media, we get a lot of insight here. And a lot of folks are, are, are jumping in now. We're finding even in 2021, we're having a lot of interest. So I wanna start, I'm gonna take a breath and ask you guys so you can see where no hit zones are, but I wanna start by asking you to annotate. Is everybody familiar with the annotation feature? So if you go up to the top of your screen and you press annotate, do you guys see that? And you'll see stamp. I'd love for you to annotate, put a stamp where you are. So I am in New Orleans, so I'm right there. I wish I had a red stamp, but go put it. Okay, here we go. Oh, I love this. This makes me, and if you're international, I did see earlier, we had someone um, from Kenya with us. Please just, you can add in, you can just put your name in a text box and just add in where you are for those that are international. This is fabulous. Keep it going. If anybody need help annotating, this is my favorite feature on Zoom uh, as we're all in the Zooming world. 
Yes. How do you annotate again, please? Okay. So go to the top of your screen and it, it'll, it'll at the very top, when you bring your um, cursor up, it'll pop down and you'll see in the drop down annotate, press annotate, and then you can go to stamp and put it. But in the meantime, if you want to tell me where you're from, I will put it in there. Or if you would. Michigan. Michigan. <laughs> huh? Michigan. Michigan. Was that Salt Lake? Did I hear Salt Lake City? San Jose, California. California. Yeah, I, okay. San Jose. Yeah, I'm here in Salt Lake. Um, on my computer, I have to click the down arrow on view options to see the annotate. Ah. Yeah, I can't find awesome. the annotate, but I'm I'm from Chicago. Okay, we're putting Chicago saying, in there. A lot of people are saying Alaska and Hawaii, they can't see, but you can write that in if you're, oh, there's a little Alaska over there. We got some Alaska and Hawaii on here today. <laughs> Thank you. I couldn't make it all fit on the screen. This is fabulous. APSAC board. Look, everybody's annotating away. This makes me so happy. Um, and if you can't annotate, just go ahead and put in the comments and we'll, we'll put you on here. So I'm going to show you, I'm going to leave these annotations up for a second. And now you're going to see where we actually have registered no hit zone. So these are the folks that have completed our survey and said, we're a no hit zone. So I am thrilled to see we have lots of folks where there aren't and we have lots of folks where there are, so we can even get more support there. But you can see this is where folks say they actually have a policy and they have some signage up and we hope they've done training. We give them free training, we, we offer training, we give um, training. In addition to that, this is where we have folks who say they are advocates, they want to be a no hit zone and they're trying to work toward that. We also have a ton of interest internationally. Now I'm gonna clear it now, this is making me sad. Um, actually, you know what, Leslie or Alana, can somebody take a screenshot of this before I clear away? Yep, I have got one. Let me make sure it, uh, let me make sure it's saved okay, but hold on. Awesome. Yep, you are, you are screenshotted. <laughs> Yay, thank you. All right, I'm going to clear it. So clear all drawings. Um, thank y'all for sharing where you're from and thank you for being here. And it is so exciting. That's one, I, I'm always looking for the silver linings after Katrina and in this pandemic. Um, and this is definitely one of the silver linings is that we're all connecting via Zoom um, and not waiting to see each other. So hopefully we get to see each other and hug safely soon. Um, but we have also had a lot of international interest. So what is interesting is we now know, Liz has even explained earlier, we have 61 countries who have banned spanking. Now we in APSAC right now are not pursuing a legal ban. We do not believe that we would even be able to get one and we worry that there could potentially be the, the, the fallout that we could create you know, children having an additional ace of having an incarcerated parent. And thank you for those of you internationally for, and thank you for being with us today. How awesome is that? So I love that people are annotating where they are internationally. But even in countries where it has been banned, we have had interest on the No Hits On website who have signed up, who have reached out. Um, we've actually had our materials translated. Um, the actual, if you go on the, the, you will see it's in Taiwanese. We, we actually have the translation of our materials. So it's been really exciting to see this keep going. So that's where we are. I'm going to clear these annotations so you guys can see, but it's really growing. The movement is truly growing. So I want to tell you about where they are. What, what kind of organizations are leading this? So right off the bat, the biggest organization that is leading right now in having the most amount of no hit zones and have brought them are children's advocacy centers. So we have 82 that are registered on the no hit zone website to say they have signage and policy and they're rocking and rolling. Um, I have to give total shout out to National Children's Alliance and Teresa Hazar for putting together a podcast on this. And when they played this podcast in one day, we had an abundance of interest. And if I get a chance, I'm going to put this in the chat if anybody wants to see the podcast or to bring it to someone else. Um, What's interesting is we have a lot of random ones that come up at others, things that our committee didn't even think about and we keep adding to the list. Um, hospitals are where they started with Dr. M um, McDavid and where we were initially all coming from. 
but we're seeing a huge increase in schools. And I think the work in schools has been amazing. And with Mel Schneiderman and Liz Gershoff leading in, um, in the APA uh, with Division 37 and helping to bring advocacy to these schools, there's just such an option for this to grow. So we wanna highlight today, I've been asked to highlight what's going on in schools and how is that working? But you can see all the different organizations that have signed up to say that they are. I'm very excited um, to have houses of worship. Um, I was able to bring, um, we were able to, uh, uh, I think Dave Corwin, I've heard your voice. He was able to go out to Trenton, New Jersey. I followed up and did a training there. And with our board member, the Reverend Daryl Armstrong, Dr. Armstrong, he brought the first no hit zone to a Southern Baptist church in Trenton, New Jersey. Um, we have also had 80 archdiocesan schools in New Orleans become um, Catholic schools become no hit zones. And so we have a lot of progress that's happening there and so much that can be done. Now on the toolkit, it gives you very simple ways. We highly recommend, I'm gonna say this twice today, that you do have a policy. And I thank you so much, Liz, for highlighting. A policy is really important. Teachers wanna be able to approach and say, I'm so sorry, I have to let you know, this is our policy, we're a no-hit zone. Um, and so we have sample policies. So if you're in a children's advocacy centers, we have samples for you, you can cut and paste. If you're in a church, we have samples for you. We have um, other agencies in general that you could adapt for yours, hospital sample policies. Um, and, and also about practices to do. And then in schools, we have sample policies for schools. We've seen a lot of schools take this and put it into their handbook um, and make it part of that. And so we've been developing materials. We also on the toolkit and as part of looking at the research, we look at what are people most need? And what they tell us is they need sample signage. You know, it took me, I love when Liz said earlier, you have to go to a committee. It took the committee in my hospital nine months to decide they were gonna come up with these adorable cute pink signs. But it took a long time. There were a lot of committee meetings to make them happen. You know, a lot of folks have said it's so much easier if you can just get one, just like if you go buy that no smoking sign off the, the off the shelf and you can add your logo or not add your logo. So we have done it now. So you have lots of examples and um, different aspects. One of my favorite teachers I like to highlight um, was this particular teacher that we met at actually a Facebook event that was in New Orleans to help people build their pages. And if you had enough likes, you got invited. And we met her and she had this huge following of crafters. And she was the teacher and somehow or other, she ran into me and we all shared what I did. She told me what she did. And she's like, oh, I need that in my school so much so. And so she did, she led a crafting event where all these teachers created t-shirts that they all wore to school and declared that they were a no hit zone. And some of those were in schools where paddling was allowed not long ago. So they became their own, as, and as Liz talked about, bottom up. They couldn't necessarily get their administration right away to become a new hit zone. So they started wearing their own signs on their clothes. And so we've seen it come from all different directions. This was the first school that I know of that we were able to help to become a new hit zone. And in this particular school, um, Foundation Prep, they did an amazing job. They immediately put it into their handbook. And I'm gonna, if I have time later, I'm gonna let you hear a clip of them talking about, um, a teacher talking about how, yeah, it felt awkward at first. At first I was like, why are we doing this? But I was so relieved to be able to say it was a no hit zone policy. And actually talking about how she once had a parent that came into school and was in the threatening to hit her child, threatening to leave with the child. And she said, oh, I'm so sorry, this is a no hit zone. You can't do that here, but we have some resources. And the parent said, you know, I was so embarrassed by his behavior. And I felt like I needed to do something because people were looking, but I didn't really want to hit him. And the parent actually, she said, broke down in tears. And she goes, and I was able to connect and I was able to give this parent resources. And this kid was having trouble in 
in school. And so what we're trying to do to help for those of you who might want to become advocates to get this into schools or, or in any organization, but for schools is give you examples of what you could send so that if a school was doing this, if you had multiple absences, a sample letter that could be sent home that had no shame or blame. If you had a bad report card that was going home, instead of sending that report card home, not knowing the consequence or a child saying, you have no idea what my dad's going to do. Instead, having resources that could help with this, with issues around these grades. Um, and so samples that could have samples at the start of the year um, and samples that can be sent, you know, to help them even understand what they're doing and in policies. So that's a big piece that that really we have found is very helpful. And we're right now trying to develop the same thing because we have parents who are trying to send it out. They don't want their restaurant. They don't want their grocery store. They don't want to witness this and they don't want to see the violence and they want to help kids and they want samples to do it. So if you have developed any samples and you want to share them, you put them on there, we share them with others. So that's this that's what this toolkit is meant to be. Um, not to say that you can't be a no hit zone if you don't sign up. Absolutely, go be a no hit zone. We hope you lead the world in becoming a no hit zone. Our goal is just to help. Um, I really learned a lot from this school because we did focus groups with them and we went back and we listened to them and we heard about how they needed more. And I'll conclude today about many of them said, okay, I can tell the parent we're no hit zone, but I want to know, what do I say after that? What do I, what are some alternatives I give? What do I do? And so we really did work with them to develop more training to help with that. And I'm going to tell you how we made that as easy as we can. Um, I also want to give another shout out to Dr. Alexander and his colleagues out in Florida, they actually show that we know, you know, from the research that he did, that when report cards were going home on Fridays, there was a big uptick in child protection being called over the weekend, that kids were experiencing physical discipline that was resulting in injuries, kids going back to school on Monday with injuries. Um, and some of their conclusions was, well, don't send report cards home on Friday. What I'd like to recommend is that we send report cards home with these letters and we get schools to buy in. Now, I have to give credit, I don't think she could make the call today, but to Sister Mary Ellen, a dear friend of mine, um, who has been a colleague for years, she um, got me involved with our Archbishop, who's really tried in New Orleans to do some great stuff to implement change. Um, and she also got me involved I'm with, um, oh, you're here, Sister Mary Ellen, are you there? You are, I, I didn't even see you there. Um, but she has been a real leader in doing this work. Um, she also got me involved with the National Review Board for helping with the US Catholic bishops. But she has brought no hit zones. We have 80 archdiocesan schools and she has brought training where there was no way that we could do it. She did a train the trainer and she brought the training video into schools. Um, St. Rita's was one of the first schools to um, buy in, and we have with us today, and I want Sister Mary Ellen to tell you about how it worked for her also, Brittany Bro. and Brittany was introduced to you in the beginning. Brittany is um, a social worker. She's a certified social worker. She's been at St. Rita's for seven years. Um, and she, you know, Sister Marilyn says, oh gosh, Brittany loves her no hit zone. And I know that she could help you understand. And we have actually done a booster with her. Um, Brittany's getting her doctorate in social work and she is with us. Brittany, do I see you? There you are. Okay. In my corner. Right? I'm here. Yes. Uh, do you want to tell us about your no hit zone and how that's gone for you? Yes, absolutely. So for us personally, especially the demographic of children that we serve, it has truly been a significant positive change for our students. Um, a lot of our students, when the parents come in, if a teacher makes a phone call, the parents wanna come immediately to us. And they come and they're very upset and they want us to pull the child from the class and they want immediate gratification. They wanna to talk to that child and address them right then and there. The signs have really helped prevent that abuse from occurring. Um, and we have, as a whole school collaboratively, have been able to say, even if it's simply pointing at the sign and saying, I'm sorry, but our school has a policy and it's a no hit zone policy and you're not allowed to do that they, to do that here. Parents immediately, for the most part, you see that they just kind of make this deep sigh and it's not maybe exactly what they want to hear, but they recognize it. And for the most part, they support it and they stop and it gives you that moment to then intervene. And the information that you share with us, Stacey, the pamphlets that we're able to say here, here's some different options. 
we don't have to necessarily use physical discipline in order to get the positive response that we want from the child. So it's truly been a remarkable um, difference made in our school. That's awesome. And, and Brittany, if you have a second, um, have you ever had, a, you know, a situation like, and you were telling me about the situation with the receptionist utilizing yes. it. You want to tell everybody about so that? So we had a parent that um, for, since first grade and he's in third grade now, weekly of every other week, I had to, and Sister Mary Ellen probably knows about these students, I had to constantly call the parents for whatever, it, whatever situation that the child might have been in. Um, Dad was allowing the student to play different video games, which was making his violence and his temperament in the classroom to be heightened. And he couldn't understand why, because he would say, you do it at home, that's fine, but you can't do it at school. But he expected his six-year-old to be able to make this differentiation between the two, which was hard for him to be able to do. So he came in this one particular day and he was just ready. Well, he was downstairs already because unfortunately he was being sent home for the day from multiple occurrences that had happened and his teacher was not with us, but he was downstairs. He comes barging through the door and he was just ready to give him a spink and probably like he's never seen before. And the receptionist stopped. She was like, hold up. I'm sorry. You see that sign? We have a policy and you're not allowed to do that here. So you, you just have to stop. And she said it made such a big difference for her because like we've heard before, she didn't know her position. Was it okay for her to tell another parent that they were not allowed to discipline their child in the way that they wanted to? But her comfort level, because we have the sign and we have it right there by her desk, she uses it all the time now. And she's like, I'm sorry, but you're not allowed to do that here. And mm -hmm. she loves it. And, you know, it's just, it's tremendously made a difference even for her and our staff overall. I mean, we have report card nights and especially you mentioned don't send the kids home on a Friday for those bad grades. We do it on a Wednesday, but if students do have report cards that are not typically what we think the parents want, we invite the parents to come. Um, and that gives us an opportunity to also share the information with them, which we were just recently able to do, which I forgot to mention to you the other day when we spoke. But we give them the report card with the information and say, you know, here, here's another option that we can do. It doesn't necessarily have to lead to spinking. Awesome. And Brittany, have you had any experience where you feel like it's going from no hit zone school to no hit zone home? Oh, absolutely. Um, one uh, family in particular that I can think of that I've been working with for quite some years now, I've counseled with this mom. Uh, you know, sometimes we think it's just the students that we counsel with, but really for me, it's the whole family system. If we're not reaching the family themselves, then we're not going to see a significant change. So I've been working with this mom and just a few weeks ago, she brought to my attention. She said, you know, Miss Bro." Every time that I get upset or I get aggravated or heightened to that level to where I think I want to smack or speak or just do whatever it may be that I would have done before, she said, your words are constantly in my mind. She said, so I want to thank you because I'm starting. She said, I don't want to say that it's completely gone, but if I went from 100% of always doing it, I'm probably down to like 25 to 30%. And of course, I tell her that's great, but our goal is to get you to zero. And I know we can get there. We just have to keep working on it. So parents are very receptive. And I think, you know, for the most part, when parents choose to spank or choose that discipline style, it's just because they really don't know any other alternative. So it's for us to give them that information to teach them different ways of being able to effectively discipline their children. And like you mentioned before, I think the parents want that instant gratification. If they see us spank in their child, then they think that we're as upset as they should be. And that's not necessarily the case. So it's up to us to give them the tools that they need so they understand that we're here to support them, but we could do it in a, a much more effective uh, manner. Thanks, Brittany. And Brittany, do you think that the materials and training helps? Help? Oh, absolutely. You, you just came out to us a few weeks ago. And prior, we had it, you know, we've been having no hit zone at St. Rita for some time now, but we had some new staff um, join us this past year. And the overwhelming positive response that we received from the staff as a whole has truly um, been a blessing. They now feel more comfortable that now that they have this, they understand what to do with it. I've even gave some of the pamphlets to my teachers because I encourage them if the parents reach out to them first, it's okay for them to have that voice and to share with the parents this information. It doesn't always have to directly come from the social worker or the counselor from the school themselves. 
Um, so the teachers are much more at ease, I think, and more comfortable saying, no, you can't do this. This is a no-hit zone policy. Um, and it, it just takes maybe that, that burden or that uncertainty off from them. And it takes that reflection from them onto the school as a whole, as a bigger uh, component of that. Thank you, Brittany. That that was awesome. And I, I just want to give a big shout out to your principal, Sandra, who really has been a supporter. We brought Stacy Patton. Um, she opened up her gymnasium. We had a community event. And I can't tell you how many folks were in that audience and were sitting on the edge of their chair, very much not wanting to buy in. And in the end, were buying Stacy Patton's book and crying and are now big followers. And whenever yes. she comes back to town, she's going to be having a, another community event through my ACES class. And they still come every time. And when I did this event, you know, um, recently and everybody got, we now have like door hangers that we give out at conferences. And I'm so excited to be able to give them where they can buy materials if they would like to. Um, but th that they took them and they also, we had bumper stickers that thanks to Melinda and her group of champions got these done. Um, and I recently was writing down the, the um, Carrollton and saw a bumper sticker and I ha knew it had to be from this training and nothing makes me happier. So thank you. <laughs> you for know, and to me even mention for the door hangers, we have them on just about every single door that you can possibly imagine in the building. And it was just on this past Monday, I was walking down the hallways and a student put, took one off and she showed it to another student. And she said, this sign says you can't hit. And it deflected the other student from stopping to hit the other student. So it's circling around and it's really working from everyone and the kids are absorbing it too. So it's, it's been truly amazing. Well, and I thank you. And I thank you for opening your school and, and being a leader in your school to keep it going um, and do a booster too. Sister Mary Ellen, did you want to add anything? I don't want to put you on the spot, but, <laughs> but since you're here. Thank you. Thank you, Brittany. Thank you, Stacy. Um, Brittany is doing a phenomenal job. She and her principal are, are phenomenal over there. Um, but I do, somebody was asking in the chat room about doing this in their daycare centers. Um, we have put it into our Head Start programs um, for all of our, in our child care centers um, through Catholic Charities. And they're very pleased with it. They also have the signs. Um, but, you know, as we look at this, I, I was, I'm dealing with the situation in a school right now. And the first question I asked when I first got the phone call last week from this counselor at the school was, what is, how do the parents treat the child um, because of the child's actions in the school? And they said, well, we don't know. So they called the parents in and they had a meeting and they said, well, now we can answer your question. So, you know, my, the importance for the no hit zone is if we don't teach our children now to be respectful, to resolve issues without violence, um, without hitting or reaching out to hurt anybody in any way, then they're not going to know how to do it when they're older. They're learning how to respond or react to what's going on in their lives. We want them to learn kindness and compassion, not to just automatically hit someone. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And thank you for your work. And, you know, Sister Marilyn has opened all the inroads um, and, you know, to get the Archdiocese to have 80 schools to hang up signs and, and been a real community leader. So if you guys have questions for Sister Marilyn or um, Brittany in the chat, please continue. I'm gonna tell you about how you can get um, more resources here. And Brittany, I know you need to leave us early, but thank you so much for joining us and, and, and sharing your experience. Thank I appreciate it. Thank you so much it. for having me. I'll be around to probably about 2.50 or so, so we're good. Thank you. Um, so right in line with this, to have Brittany say that the, the resources and the materials are really crucial. The research tells us that. I really do want to urge you, if you're going to do a no-hit zone, maybe go beyond that laminated sign. Get something that's permanent and invest in a little bit of materials. And now folks have done it for you. So, you know, the research is pretty clear that if parents can get access to materials, we know that the no-hit zone is really going to help change attitudes of those key informants and, 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 and reach some. 
long, but having access to materials are really crucial. And Dr. Harrington, which I, I got to go out to Virginia too and do some training there, they've done some great job with really showing how important the materials are also. So what we did was we decided to develop some materials. So the No Hits Own Committee, um, all unpaid, not making any money off of this, put together materials, APSAC hosts them on their website. Um, they are through APSAC that you could purchase these. You can buy them in bulk. And what we try to do is we recognize that what you're going to tell someone about not getting an infant, and we know that um, a, a 30% of parents report starting to spank in, you know, toddlers and in, in, in infancy and 70% by toddlers. So we wanted to make sure that we had it. So the materials are done so that if you have, if you have these materials, if you have a parent of an infant, you would give them this one. But if you have a parent of a school age child, you're going to give them that age. If you have a teenager and they're dealing with potentially sexting, we're addressing that. All of the materials are uniform on the back to talk about and summarize the research. And it really helps kind of bring it home. Now, what's interesting, when I've done this and I give, every time I would go, we need more materials. We need something to give them. We need something to give them. And then finally, one time I went, same audience, same network. And they're like, you know what, Stacey, I think it would help if you made the materials like a paper airplane so that we can just throw them from across the room at the parent. I'm like, okay, we need training. It's not hard to have this conversation. It's about approaching without judgment. So luckily at the summit, we had um, a whole leading group to talk about the no hit zones. And we put together what I call the talking heads video. It's a 20 minute video. It's very quick. Um, and I just want to play you one clip of it, but I do want you to know Dr. Taylor and um, uh, Dr. Uh, Julia Fleck, they're all researching how this has happened. And so we had played this video with just a few slides afterwards, all of which are available on the toolkit and to over 500 subjects. And what they found is pretty universal that viewing the video definitely decreased positive attitudes towards corporal punishment and increased negative attitudes. So, and it was across demographics, that research should be being published by the end of this year. So you'll have access to that. And that is a free video. There are two versions. One is for hospitals that kind of leads with um, very much in hospital, why it's important for a hospital to do this. And the other one is more for schools. And we did that for Sister Mary Ellen to be able to use. So I'm just gonna show a real short clip if it plays. It's. It seems to me it's the keystone. If we can uh, get people raised without violence, we can reduce the violence in the family. We're a much better shot at having a peaceful and nonviolent society. So, and there's Dr. David Finkelhorst, and most of you I know who are in this field recognize him and know um, that he is definitely someone that we all look to for leadership and to have him say it's the keystone. Um, we always follow the video with these black slides that can be adapted. So, so if you don't want to be out there doing the training and you want to do a train the trainer, these are some slides. What I try to do in every training is to get folks to be able to say that the main thing you're going to do is approach calmly without judgment, recognize, and I always say it's the four R's. And I've had a lot of teachers say, I remember those four R's. Recognize the situation. Waiting is hard parenting is hard. It's hard to get a kid buckled into their car seat. It's so hard to check out, you know, uh, recognize the situation that the parent is, see it a little bit from their lens, um, respect their role. You know, if they say you have no business, you're so right. You're the parent. I just want to help. And if it's a no hit zone, it is so easy to be able to say, you've got that badge and you can just say, oh, this is a no hit zone. I'm obligated to let you know that for the safety and protection of everyone, we are a no hit zone. I'm obligated to say something, but how can I help you? It is that simple. If you can get folks to just rehearse that and then go back and say, we're gonna do it as a pilot. And in a couple of weeks, we're gonna come back together and see if anybody had problems. You will be shocked at how they're like, it was so easy. This was so much easier. Now I have a whole bunch of videos that I did skits where you'd have a parent with a slipper. I have a whole bunch of skits if you wanna see them about me doing just that. But it is truly that simple. Um, and if you can get folks just to remember these four R's, 
and, and to approach with sympathy. Now it's hard. If you see someone with their hand raised, your your your, your natural instinct is one, maybe to go, oh, I'm, I'm afraid of danger or to rush over. But I find if you rush over or if you do it with judgment or you do it with aggression, it doesn't work. And my children, my family can tell you they've seen over years me having plenty of practice where it didn't work. Now I always try to approach calmly, always take control of my voice, always try to lower my voice, always try to get into a different posture so I'm not towering over anyone or coming at them aggressively and asking them how I can help. What I do find is helpful um, in training is to go through this piece, is to truly just go through and say, what can I do? So, hi, how can I help you? And not to judge them to recognize the situation, waiting is hard. I'm obligated to let you know this is a no hit zone. Thanking them, thank you for respecting our policy. Parenting is so hard. Would you like some materials? Oh, I see you have a young toddler. That can be a challenging age. It can also be such an exciting age, right? They're learning. But here's a whole group, a whole bunch of materials of things that can be harmful and some great things, and at least three alternatives, because we know no one thing works for parents. And there's an abundance. You're one Google click away from some great alternatives. I have read all the leading um, parenting books, and we're doing a research project to talk about what's in all these great books. There's a bazillion alternatives out there. You don't have to give them all of them. Just give them one little alternative to try or two or three. So if one doesn't work and they're not going back to the hitting when they're most frustrated. I do love distraction. I did a distraction, just a real simple little distraction thing. Lots of coloring sheets. You don't have to do it in color. So it doesn't cost a bunch to print. Um, really great to have something to distract. We used to have a little pink brain you could squeeze and talk about the impact of the brain. All of those things are just really helpful. Um, the other thing that's really important is not to threaten with reporting. You know, if there's an injury or if this is someone hitting an infant or someone hitting a child because they're angry at someone else, of course, we're going to have to as probably as mandated reporters to make a report to get them help. But it's way beyond mandated reporting. It's time to move beyond that and be about a mandated supporter or someone just coined that phrase. I think it's a fabulous way to think about it. But how can I help them? Um, but threatening to report is really not, you know, legally where, where you should be. If you have to report it because it, it is resulting in an injury and it's unreasonable, you absolutely are going to report it. You don't have to threaten them. That That's not helpful. Um, but make sure you're following your policy and your law. But we really want to make sure our no hit zone policy is followed out in a way that's without shame, without blame, and is helping. Um, but we want to make sure we're always thanking folks. Now, simple, simple things. If you're looking for tools and you do not have to buy these tools, we this is truly just done because folks were saying it's too hard to get someone to make it. This was the most neutral. It was child abuse prevention. We know this is a prevention. It's a key to prevention. So it was in Child Abuse Blue. Um, it's got the mantra that we really firmly think that folks need. And people said they needed samples. So we invested time. Um, Melinda got a great uh, designer to put this together and they host it out there if you wanna buy them. And they even have floor talkers if you wanna in include about being safe distance. So really good flip. Now, if I stopped here and I asked for questions, someone would ask me, I don't think I would want a sign that starts with a no. I want to start with something that is much more neutral. I want to start with something that feels better. And there were some groups that did. And, you know, I know um, Randy, when he did his, they did hit free zone um, and something, you know, and that's still we know that this is a no hit zone. But some groups did things that had other messages that weren't very clear. And I liken that to if we had clean air signs, breathe clean air back in the 60s, we likely would have had people very confused as to what that message was. And we would likely have people, that's a really great idea as they're puffing away. You should breathe clear there and get the pollution out. It's not a clear message. And so we really want to make sure that we are kind of making sure that the message is there. We want to make it gentle. I used to love the pink signs that had a lot of messaging about um, uh, painless parenting works. And I, I'm a big believer in that kind of concept. Um, but the signs look different. And so we've had a lot of folks as churches, um, the Archdiocese has done a different one. The, the United States Catholic Bishops has a, a cute little pink sign that's in a green spacey area. Um, 
there are a lot of different things. Um, the church in Trenton, they're doing a dove for the sign of peace, but they all know, know they all have the mantra. They all have the, the fundamental pieces that this is a place where no adult hits another adult, no adult hits a child, no child hits another child, no child hits an adult. Also, lots of folks start to um, involve animals. And if you have a sign with animals, please let me know. We'd love to include it and tell others about what you're doing. So these are resources. Um, Dr. Patton and myself also wrote a book. We do not get any um, profits from this book. You can order it. That's for parents. That's actually for parents that talks about the harms of hitting. And then it's a workbook in the pack with all kinds of alternatives. We have the materials coming out soon in Spanish. I'm really excited that we're gonna, we're gonna at least get the, the um, fundamental cover in, in Spanish. And so we know that materials are going to be crucial to help and to understand this. We also know that without signage, that as a reminder, there are a lot of folks, I think um, Liz talked about this earlier, that we're seeing 50% of physicians say they saw hitting in the last year. And 27% of nurses and 17% of non-direct staff. And they say that they didn't know what to do. So this signage really helps remind everyone what this is and reducing it. And so we want to make sure and also understand that it's upsetting for all the other folks that are seeing it. Um, we have designed this toolkit to cover the, what we call the entire spectrum of prevention. If you do any work in um, in public policy and in you know in understanding how to do prevention, it really is considered. Uh, Dr. Larry Cohen um, in, uh, researched this to show if you to change cultural norms to put something as Liz said earlier, not just top down, not just policy, but also involves individual changes, organizational changes, staff training, um, a crucial piece because we don't want people threatening parents. Um, and so just to walk you through how this works, we want to make sure that we have a policy. It's really nice. I used to love to have like a sticker that we'd stick on your badge to say, oh, I have to let you know. So every person's got it right there, right after they go through training, just like when you get your flu shot and now your COVID shot, you get your your sticker on your badge. If you ever worked in a hospital, you're aware of this. That's a great way for you to get this messaging out at very, very low cost. Putting it into um, a handbook in a school, a great way to do it. Making sure you invest in permanent signage. This was a, um, a, a, uh, a, it's actually called a battered women's shelter, not typically what we call it, but it was an IPV um, shelter. And we put it, they wanted it in there. Um, they definitely wanted it in the laundry room. They said that was one of the, the most common places. And so they put lots of materials in the laundry room and they would just disappear. And it just warmed my heart to think that folks really wanted them. And we want to make sure that we're getting them out there, that folks can use them and that they stay. Um, we definitely think coalitions, getting other folks. Um, Dr. Alexandra always talks about how we need in the levels. It's really good for your no hit zone to move beyond you and you need help to do it. So find a friend in your community and say, let's do this together is a great way to build this network. Um, staff training is crucial. If you can mandate the staff training in your policy, that's really easy. If you can get in person, that's better than online. But we're finding even with online, we're having great success. Cannot say enough about evaluation. The tool that Dr. Gershoff and Dr. Taylor developed is a, a modification that we used it in evaluating the No Hit Zone video is actually available for free on the toolkit. You can download it and you can use it as a simple pre and post. And we'd love if you would share your results and let us know what you've learned. We have found in doing the evaluations that we have really changed our messaging. So really, you know, for a long time, a lot of us would talk about what was the key pieces of the research. One of the key pieces is that hitting kids resulted in physical abuse, but that was not a message that changed behavior. No parent thought they were gonna cross that line. And I was always say, well, until you do, but, um, but they didn't believe that they would. So that wasn't an effective messaging. Um, I personally thought the messaging about if you hit your child, they're gonna hit others. You know, Dr. Taylor's research has shown by age five, kids are showing more aggression. But what we found is that the number one thing that parents, when they heard about it, paused and said, oh, I need to know more about that, was the impact on the brain, the impact on IQ, um, and then some other things with the harms of the research. What was interesting is that folks will say, oh, well, you just need to give them alternatives. 
that wasn't the number one thing that folks said changed their mind. The number one thing was knowing about the harms to the brain and the changes in IQ in school. Um, having resources was a close was second, but not a close second. So important to know. So we're really trying to adapt our messages as we do evaluation. And of course, we're continuing to learn. And we have great reason to believe from Dr. Finkelhor's research and some other research I hear um, that's showing that maybe we're to about like under 50%, like 49% of parents um, are hitting um, in the last year, but that's reducing. That's much in, in reduced from the 70% that we used to see. One of the other things I think it's important, and we wrote this in our article and I wanted to reiterate it, um, an intern that worked with me to help develop this, Madison, who was a Duke Engage intern, she did some research on barriers. And what she found is that quell any concerns that this is going to have a legal ramification. Make sure you make that. And, and that was a big part. They got this baseball field. And there, Liz, is an example of someone going beyond park. So um, Louisville Bat Slugger Field became a no-hit zone. So those were really um, important pieces. The other thing folks always ask me when I'm doing no hit zone training, okay, sure, we implement the no hit zone, but what about when the parents start to argue with me? I'm not prepared. I have anxiety about that. Well, one, we don't find it's that common in our no hit zones if we just follow those four R's. Um, but I worked real closely with Dr. Patton, who's a leading, leading researcher in understanding the cultural, creating cultural responsiveness, but making sure that we're, we're responding re regardless of culture, to, but just to make sure we're responsive. But I worked with um, Dr. Patton, Stacey Patton, and sort of developed what are the big com the biggest things that people fear and what are some ways that we can address them? So in our last couple of minutes together, I'm gonna tell you some ideas of ways you can address this um, with Without fear. Um, and so what we found is from the research that's been done internationally is that there's some key components that have to be addressed that we need to make sure that we're communicating to parents that spanking is harmful from the research. And Dr. Gershoff has done extensive research and we know from over 1500 studies and her meta-analysis that it's harmful that it's ineffective, that kids are pretty much repeating the behavior in a very short period of time, and that there are so many alternatives, painless parenting alternatives that work, that are successful, rather than using something that's ineffective. The other thing I wanna make a point of is that a lot of folks will tell me from mental health background, that they'll use motivation interviewing, which is great. And it really does work well to ask parents what they're using. Have you ever had to hit again for the same thing? But there's a piece in motivational interview we can't forget. There's a tell. We need to do some socio education to explain to them about the harms. And we can't assume that they know this. And we can't assume if they give them a whole bunch of alternatives that when they're most frustrated, they're gonna go back to this if we don't tell them the harms. So don't they at least have a right to understand the research? And Dr. Holden, um, George Holden, he's done some amazing research that says just a little bit of knowledge about the research helps. So I love to summarize the research. Um, I, Joan Lipsky actually came up with this about her summary of the research. I constantly include Liz in whatever I'm doing to give her credit for evaluating and doing this meta-analysis of all the research. Um, I also make sure I include Murray Strauss's research about what we know about IQ and intelligence. And I do find that this summary works really well. So this is the materials that we developed and it's just a really great summary. Um, it highlights first and foremost, the study that was done at Harvard Medical School um, that showed that, we, that there is some uh, correlation to less gray matter in three parts of the brain between kids, young adults who were spanked as children as opposed to not having been spanked. Um, some folks that study says it was harsh in the South, that would not be considered harsh. It was just like once a month, 12 times a year and once with an object. That wouldn't be harsh from um, my perspective, my cultural perspective here in my family, my community, and what I've seen in running a, a, a medical program. So, but the fact that there's these 1500 studies all showing that the harms and where it all is, I love this summary. Um, I think Joan Durant uh, gave this to me. And, you know, just about those IQ. I also love that Liz highlighted the, the fact that we now know that spanking should be um, considered as an ACE and that one article of the year from a child abuse and uh, prevention. 
So the big clapbacks that I just want to make sure I address, there's three that I want to make sure that you're leaving today and feeling like this has been addressed. I turned out okay. Now, my tendency on this one, if it's someone I know, if it's a friend of mine to say, well, that's debatable, let's ask our friends. But when I'm professionally, I would never do that. Um, and I don't you know argue about whether or not someone turned out okay. But I always make a point of, are there are there other things that your parents did that were risky that you wouldn't repeat? And I think that's just a really neutral way to not shame or blame anyone's parents. So for instance, in my home, my mom smoked when she was pregnant with me. Now I have a law degree and I got my master's degree and my parents always tell me I turned out okay. And my response is, we'll never know how good I could be because I was spanked as a child. Now, I never had a bicycle helmet. I never wore a seatbelt. I remember my dad actually taking the seatbelts and sticking them into the seat because he didn't like the fact that they felt the way they felt when um, he would sit on them. Um, I don't think I ever had a contraption like this. I just had either my grandmother or my mother's arm. And we did have a convertible at some point in time. And I remember riding in it frequently. Um, I rode in the back of a pickup truck and I was spanked as a child. Some would argue I turned out okay. I would like to be able to say, well, never know how good I could have been. But I survived all of these, but I wouldn't take these risks with my own children. It's just a great neutral way to do it. The other thing that I cannot do this without addressing, folks will say it's in my culture. You're correct. It's in everybody's culture. You know, we know from child trends that there are, there are a lot of people that have this myth that they believe that certain races spank more. And yet we can see in this that you have more um, white non-Hispanic fathers who believe in a good hard spanking than black non-Hispanic mothers than Hispanic parents. So the only demographic in this group, when this was done with child trends, where it was less than 50% was for Asian parents. So it's really important that we understand it's in all cultures, but that we are utilizing cultural humility and being responsive in not saying that it's still harmful. There's no moderators. So no matter the race, the religion, or the, the color of that child's skin, that, that does not moderate the harm. And so we need to make sure we're communicating the harm regardless of culture, but we're being culturally responsive and understanding that a lot of folks think it might not be in ours or that we're judging them. And so we wanna make sure that we're doing this in a way that helps understand the harms without doing any additional harm. Um, Stacy Patton is the leading researcher on that. She's going to be doing, if you go to the Up Institute Facebook page, we'll have an event very shortly. Um, that's going to be a free community event that you could, you know, sign into. Um, the other piece that we've got to address is we have the old, oh, but it's in the Bible, spare the rod, spoil the child. So this is the cover of a book. No, that's not in the Bible. That's a poem. Um, you know, I have this picture of this shepherd, Kathy Taylor and I actually, um, as I say, like I carried her briefcase and we went to an Ispacan conference in Ireland and we got to meet this shepherd and we asked him, would you ever hit the sheep with, with, with your staff? And he said, oh, absolutely not. The staff is to hit the predators away, to hit the wolves away. The only thing you would do with it is with the hook, pull them back into the flock. And so when you think about that in terms of guidance, um, another, there's two books that I highly recommend if you want to know more about this particular issue. Um, I love uh, Victor Veed's book on this rock. And another great book is Jesus, the Gentle Parent. So if you have a parent that really is reading scripture, this is a great book that really talks about how Jesus was probably the first social worker that ever walked the face of the earth um, and to help folks. So we really hope that by the end of this, that you might want to become a no-hit zone in your organization or your home, um, and that in the process of doing that, you will at least sign up to become a certified advocate, that you might even take this seal and put it on your signature. Um, it's a pretty simple thing to do. We have some levels of involvement, and we just hope that you will join us. Um, this original summit, this is all a group of volunteers who are very committed to say, what can we do to translate all of this research that Dr. Gershoff has summarized for us and put together in this meta-analysis, how can we bring this to folks? Um, so very simple. You just, you can start off as just one person, 
become a no hit zone advocate, move to where you're getting some signage, get some training for staff, and then maybe bring this into community. You use your voices as school psychologists to send a letter to a school and say, would you consider being a no hit zone? I can help you do it. Here's some resources or just link them to us and we'll help them do it. Um, anything that, you know, the, where it can help. So you can take the no hit zone advocate. It's in my signature. You can just stick it in your signature. Once you sign up, you actually get the PDF and you can put it anywhere, put it in your PowerPoints, put it in your presentation. Um, let us know, come to an APSAC conference when we get to do them live and we'll give you materials. We always have them out on the table, but we need all of you. The only way that this is, this is a grassroots effort we have no funding at the current, um, but we need all of you in order to bring the messaging out. So if you are ready to become a no hit zone, I encourage you just to go here, click here, sign up. We will send you an email and help you through this. Um, if you just wanna become a certified advocate and know more about it, I do wanna give you one other opportunity. So that's one or two, become an advocate or become a certified um, advocate or, or, or Become a new its own. Um, do a policy and hang a sign and, and, and sign up and we'll put you on the map. Um, I also want to tell you about another opportunity as it relates to using your voices for advocacies and to be to move so we can all move from being bystanders to upstanders. Um, but um, Congressman McEachin um, in conjunction with um, Bonamici and uh, I believe Senator Murphy will be refiling their bill to end the practice of hitting school children with boards um, in March. And so please come back and check out APSAC and PCA, APSAC and PCA, along with the National Initiative to End Corporal Punishment and the US Alliance are all banding together and trying to get your voices. So if you would like to sign on, if you go to my Facebook page, I share this, you can sign on now, let us know you wanna be involved and we will share your name so that you can get on even before your organization can be listed as a supporter. If you live in one of the Southern states where it's still practice, we really need congressmen to sign on. Um, and I hope that you will stay safe. Um, our goal here truly is, and I, I'm going to use the words of um, Frederick Douglass, it is so much easier to build strong children, healthy children, than it is to repair broken men. This is a great way to reduce adverse childhood experiences. And so I hope that you would join us in bringing your voices and your energy and your passion um, to help get those out there. And I'm gonna end with this slide and open it up for questions, but I'm gonna ask you guys to annotate now. This is just some symbols um, of different places where you think no hit zones might be helpful. And if you wanna write in words that we haven't even thought about them, people keep telling me airlines. I'm like, okay, give me a contact. Does somebody know someone that owns Delta? But, <laughs> I, um, but if you have ideas, I'd love for you to annotate. So we're seeing hospitals, restaurants, um, parks, buses, school buses, um, law offices, legal offices, judges, um, grocery stores, lots of everybody always says, can you get it in my grocery store? Can you get it in my grocery store? Police station, you know, stadiums. Um, I used to go to Saints um, games, always would bring a sign with me. So I would like to open it up for questions in our last 10 minutes together. I am taking a screenshot real quick. Okay. Oh, this is making me so happy, you know. <laughs> Hold on, making sure it's saving. And then I will read out some questions. Well, while I'm doing that, um, just some people are just wondering what languages all this information is available in. Um, people are asking about Spanish, French, German. We have a lot of languages. Gosh, I wish, I wish. And if you have contacts that are able to do that, we had it professionally translated. But then when we had folks, Lisa Fontes, I think I saw Lisa out there, but um, we had some folks read it and they said that actually um, for, uh, for to be culturally humble with, with as it relates to chocolate cu culture, we didn't get it right. And so now we're trying to get it so that it is more assimilated for that community. Um, but if you have resources or you want to be a resource to review materials, please let us know. It is our goal. Um, 
Somebody's saying they can translate into French. And people are asking about your email too, Stacey. So if you want to put your email, somebody already volunteered to translate in French for you guys. <laughs> Yay. Okay, Stacy at the Up Institute. Thanks. And if okay. you sign up, yep, you will get my cell phone number. So when you, if you sign up on the, the thing, I usually schedule a call with everybody and try to help them. This is, I love this. Oh my gosh, this yeah. is amazing. I, I wish I had numbers here. And National Children's Alliance has been huge. Lots of CACs reach out constantly. And they're putting it on their conference schedule and getting buy-in and bringing it to police and DA's offices and, um, and, and bringing it even to the mental health community. It's been fabulous. Thank you so much. Thank you guys all. We have definitely have a lot of questions. We'll see what we can get to. A lot of people have been asking about legislation. And has there been any legislation anything legal with the no hit zones. A lot of people are saying you kind of, you need policy with the practice. So I was wondering if there's been any, any legislation or any push towards legislation for no hit zones. No, currently it's all, well, I, and I take that back. I mean, I think for the parks that was city council. So that was local um, action, but there's been no federal legislation. This, the, this is the first time um, that we think we're getting close to banning corporal punishment in schools. Um, and we're the only industrialized country that still um, allows for the hitting of children with boards in schools. Thank you. A lot of people were also asking about when talking to parents about alternatives, do you have any suggestions about positive alternatives or programs to offer parents as well? And Liz, jump in here at any point. Um, yes, uh, tons and tons of suggestions. Um, actually, I personally, I mean, I guess everybody has their favorite. I love the Dutch way of parenting. Um, I absolutely love um, peaceful parenting. I, I do find that parents love parenting communities. So I'm a member, I'm on the board of stopspanking.com and Robin Peters Bennett runs that. And she has some amazing parenting groups. People can sign up to be a part of the group. And as long as they keep the language positive, people bring their problems to the, to the group and parents talk about real solutions that work. They're very empathetic, not judgmental. I am always so amazed and it reminds me, I mean, my kids, um, one going into law school and one just graduated from law school. I'm out of that. But when I hear their, their frustrations, especially pandemic parenting, I'm so sympathetic. And so that parenting community online and um, a bunch of gr groups have formed together and they're going to do a whole spank out week um, related to bringing communities together around alternatives, if that helps. And Liz, do you want to add anything? Oh, I think, uh, I think uh, Robin's website is great. She's got lots of links to other places. Um, and um, there's a, our colleague Joan Durant created uh, positive discipline in everyday parenting uh, with uh, several international organizations. And so that's another website you can go to. And there's a free book that you can download and give to parents. It's like a workbook uh, at a very easy reading level. Um, and I think they've got it in several different languages as well. Awesome. Thank you. I think we have some time for some more questions. Um, a lot of people were asking about, they were wondering about the idea of telling people this is a no hit zone, but it, now it makes it think like it's okay to do it at home. So has there been a lot of push to do this in like no hit homes, like in the homes? Um, because a lot of people were concerned that, that would be like not here, but okay there kind of situation. You know, the number one concern I got in my own, um, when I was starting this in my, in my network, everybody was afraid that people were going to drag their kids out of the hospital and then like hit them in our parking lot. So we made sure that our parking lot and our entire property was a no hit zone. And then folks were like, oh, they're going to put them in their cars and they're going to hit them. Um, what we actually found though, is that actually parents found other ways to de-escalate the situation. And as long as we approached them to help and not judge them, we never we never witnessed. Now, I don't know if others who have done a no hit zone have witnessed that, but we never witnessed anybody running out to do it. Now we all fear that. We all fear the parents bent up frustration is gonna be later. Um, but at the same time, we are reducing it and we're helping parents find another way. 
sort of think about no smoking. When no smoking zone started, people thought people were going to run out and, you know, puff a bunch of cigarettes. But in, quite the contrary, they were sucking lifesavers. They were finding ways. They were chewing gum. They were finding ways to get through that. And so they were developing more times for their lungs to be clean air. Um, and so I think in the same way, it's having that impact. Now, I know without a, a research, that's just my anecdotal. Liz, do you want to share anything on that? Well, I do have some research that suggests something like that. So um, no, uh, no, no spanking or physical punishments allowed in Head Start centers. And so we've done research with Head Start centers to show that be part of the way that when kids are at Head Start centers, parents end up spanking less. And I think part of it is because they see teachers using other kinds of discipline. And so they're learning by osmosis, by observing. And so they take those skills and they, uh, they use them at home. And so I think when we have no hit zones and parents can observe other ways of interacting with children and other ways of changing their behavior, they can take those skills and apply them at home. Well, I'm so glad that you could back up my, my, <laughs> my, my, my theory here. You're right um, on, Stacey. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, this is one time. Um, <laughs> hey, I got to give a big shout out. I think there's a brilliant idea in the chat, maybe as a Zoom background. I'm like, I love that idea. Why didn't I do that today? It is going to be my Zoom background. I should have no hit zone in my Zoom background. Thank you so much. And uh, that's genius. Um, something great to, I know we only have one minute, so I wanted to just, this is a good one to end with. Somebody just asked uh, me directly, actually, is there anything people can post in their social media um, to show they attended and introduce this concept to the community and, uh, and organization. So do you have anything that somebody can post today in their social media about this before we wrap up? Yes. Um, yes. Go to the No Hit Zone uh, uh, website and where it says become an advocate, you can share that and it, it shows you that goal seal. It's really great. And the, and the um, piece. I'll also post some things on the Up Institute page so that you can maybe just share them and make it really easy. I already posted um, Meacham's bill so you can see the text in case you wanna sign off. I should be very transparent to say that they are making a few edits to it. So if you sign off, the new bill might look a little different but if they're minor edits and they're only gonna improve it. Um, but yeah, I'll share some, you can go to stop spanking. They have plenty of materials and also go to the national initiative to end corporal punishment. Great campaign. If you're doing a hashtag use hashtag hit no more, um, to get that out there. I had that earlier in my presentation. And mm -hmm. I want to um, just do a little shout out. I'm seeing that some of our international friends, um, are talking about how appalling it is to see it in public. And I agree with you. It breaks my heart every time I do, but I used to look away and now I approach, I approach to see how I can help. And a lot of people are like, Oh gosh, you are crazy. Someone's going to hit you. And it's never happened. Um, and I always do approach um, and just say, Oh gosh, parenting is so hard. How can I help you? And, but it is, it is so hard to see. Thank you all so much. We're getting excellent feedback from today and a lot of people that want to be involved. I know we're reaching to the end of our, our session. So I want to thank everybody for coming. And um, thank you. We'll give a couple seconds for people to log off. But thank you all so um, for coming. And this is recorded. It will be posted on the website. And I will do some follow-up about any resources or presentations to post as well. Thank you all.